All right, uh, we're ready for our next case, and that would be Mr. Marsh. Good morning, Ms. Marsh. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please. Yes, ma'am. James Marsh, 92600. All right, and you're represented by counsel. Would you introduce yourself, please, ma'am? Uh, Micah Sloan, uh, representing Mr. Marsh. And uh, I want to acknowledge that you have some, some guests there with you today. Uh, there at the penitentiary, you have um, Russell Bordelon. Good to see you, sir. Cindy Nichols, Ivy Wenzel, Marina Nip. May I mispronounce that? Connie Pauly, Heather Pauly, Fred Nichols, Elizabeth Thompson, and Chris Thompson. Uh, so your guest there, Mr. Bordelon, will be speaking on your behalf. Uh, joining us by Zoom, we have uh, Warden Daryl Vanoy, Karen Myers, and Nicole Johnson. Um, we also have here in the room with us today, opposition representing the victim. We have Chris Lute, Boyd, excuse me, Boyd. Tamala Bowers, Sydney Boyd, Chris Bowers, Tammy Barrett, Mary Boyd, Sherry Pennington and Lindborn. Uh, and for those who've indicated they'd like to speak, we'll call on them at the appropriate information in the record. And we'll start the interview process with you. Uh, we'll hear from the warden there. We'll hear from the folks who've indicated they'd like to speak. And at the end, you'll be allowed to make a statement before we turn it over to your attorney to wrap it up for us, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, Mr. Marsh. Um, your DOC number, as mentioned, is 92600. Yes, now it's this afternoon seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced January 1980 in St. Charles Parish to a life sentence for second degree murder conviction. Mr. Morris, is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Your case has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer her questions, please? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mr. Marsh. How are you doing today? Good afternoon, Ms. Jackson. How are you? Thank you. How old are you, Mr. Marsh? Ma'am? How old are you? 63. It's your birthday. July 27, 1959. Oh, 59. Okay, we have, I have 53. Uh, so you're 69 years old, I mean, 63 years old. Yes, How long have you been incarcerated on this charge? 43 years. So you mm -hmm. were uh, about 20 uh, yes, when this crime took place? Yes, ma'am, I just turned 20. Well, I'd like to start by having you just explain explain to us uh, what happened in this uh, time, how you came to be involved and in, in what you did. So just tell us what happened. Yes, ma'am. There was me and three other people was in a bar. We'd been invited to a party earlier that day. We'd been at, went to a bar about 8.30, 9 o'clock. We were all in there drinking real heavily. And by about 2 30, 3 o'clock in the morning, we left out, headed back to our residence. On the way, on the way back to our house, we seen two men, which ended up being Mr. Boyd and Mr. Barnes, or all the way across the interstate, or across Highway 90. Someone hollered out some sort of greeting or hello, how you doing? Some type thing. And next thing you know, somebody in the in the car said, Hey, that guy just shot us a finger. So the driver of the car took it upon itself to go down and turn around and go back towards them. And when we got to the uh, got to the, where they was at, the driver and the front seat passenger got out of the car and they started an altercation with Mr. Boyd. Okay, then what? And it, it, it escalated a pretty good bit. It didn't last but about a minute, minute and a half. But uh, I, um, the third party got out of the car. He went over there and a few minutes later, I was called, I, I got out of the car. And sometime, sometime in that time period, I got, I pulled my knife and I walked up to Mr. Boyd and I stabbed him one time in the stomach. Why did you do that? I wasn't thinking. We was, we, we was terribly inebriated and I wasn't thinking at all. I was using poor judgment. 
Well, I mean, how many people were with Mr. Boyd? With him or with, oh, with, with me? With him. Three, oh, well, none. Mr. Barnes left. He took off. He went down the road. And so, so there were three of you and only him by himself. Yes, ma'am. Correct. So why, why would you feel it necessary to take Mr. Boyd's life? Well, it's, it's ma'am. He was outnumbered already. Yes, so ma'am. Feel how to stab him. It was just the thing that was going on at the time. It was just, it was like I say, it was escalated. It's up, now help me understand. So you're driving down the street and somebody thinks somebody flipped the bird. Yes, ma'am. How did that escalate into murder? And that's such a minor thing to have happened. How do you explain how that escalated into? Stabbing this man. Now I don't believe I could really under, really explain how it happened. It just I just did it. I mean, it was one of those things that, would, like I say, a heat of the moment. I just jumped out of the car and I don't even remember pulling my knife, but I just know I did. And I walked up in there and I just stabbed Mr. Boyd one time. And you're right, it, it, it didn't make any sense. Well, tell me, tell us about your drinking. Uh... How much did you had to drink that night? A lot. We've been drinking for about about six hours, five six hours. We're drinking well, we, uh, shots. Okay. And uh, how often back then? How often were you drinking? Every day. Um, when? How were you when you started uh, using alcohol? Probably in my mid teens. Okay. I had an and, abusive, ma'am. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You I, had, I had an abusive stepdad, and we used to just steal his liquor just to get away from things. So, were you an alcoholic? Yes, ma'am. And um, let's let's talk about um, what you have done. Uh, since you've been incarcerated, you know, you, oh, in your um, in your application, you uh, said that you were angry and intoxicated. So tell me what you have done uh, since uh, you've been incarcerated. How long have you been incarcerated? Forty three years. Over the last forty three years, what have you done to address? Uh, both your anger issues and your and alcoholism. So let's start with anger. What what have you done to address your anger issue? I've taken many many courses offered throughout the prison. A lot of before years ago, years ago the uh, programming wasn't done through uh through classification or uh, social workers. It was just done through the clubs. So I started taking those courses through the clubs. Well, the reason, asking, the reason I'm asking is I'm not seeing a lot of programs to address your issues. I see a lot of vocational uh, stuff, skills, employment skills, yes, but I haven't seen a lot of rehabilitative programs, programs designed to um, help you overcome whatever issues that brought you to prison to begin with. I just don't see those. And you're telling me you took a lot of them, but I don't have any documentation of those in, in my record. So could you tell us what those programs were that you took first to address anger? What did you take to address anger? I took an anger prevention program. It was a 16 week course taught by Southern University professors. What was that? Ma'am? What was that? 1998, 1998. And what'd you get out of that program? I learned how to curb my anger and how to, how to avoid uh, the little triggers that caused me to get angry and how to okay. overcome it. Give me some specifics about that. Well, just say someone come up and just started getting in my face about going crazy, you know, just 
typical everyday type stuff around this prison. Now I don't I, I don't even I don't even acknowledge it. I just pretty much say, okay, you know, I, I'm gonna listen to you. I'm gonna listen to what you got to say, and pretty much I'm gonna tell you that look, we got to get over this, and we're gonna talk about it. I, I learned to use mediation and learn to talk about my problems and help other people with theirs. Well, what about uh, alcoholism? What what have you done to address your issues with alcohol? Yes, ma'am. I've taken numerous AA and 12-step programs. I end up uh, facilitating AA whenever the guy stepped down from it. I've taken AA to heart because I, during the, about the mid-80s, I took step five and I ended up uh, letting go and let God. And I, I just, once I made that decision, everything else kind of just cleaned itself up. I made a, uh, I got a chance to apologize to my mom and explain to her the true nature of my crime and how I committed this and the damage that I did to the Boyd family and my, my mother's family. And I got a chance to get closer to God. I realized I couldn't do this on my own. Once I made that, come to that realization, everything else just kind of fell in place. Is AA uh, the only substance abuse uh, problem that you've been involved in? No, ma'am, I went to the uh, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, but I'm, I'm not, I don't, excuse no, me. No, it's, it's the same program. It's okay. the same program. So you haven't done living in balance? No, ma'am. Haven't done celebrate recovery? No, ma'am. Uh, uh, when was the last time you attended NA or AA meeting? Last Saturday. All uh, right. How long have you and you've been going to NA and AA meetings for yes, how? It's an AA meeting, yes, ma'am, for for uh, probably last six eight months. I've been a uh, I had a stroke. Well, I had a series of strokes back in the last year, and I've been trying to overcome and doing a lot of physical therapy. Okay, let's talk about that. When did you start having strokes? December of 2021. Uh, okay. And I, and had a, I had another one in January. These are called TIA strokes. I had another one in January. I had two in February. This last one in February. Left me uh, paralyzed in my left arm, my left leg. Okay. Um, so six months before the stroke, I'm trying to understand how 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 often do you facilitate in a or AA meetings? Okay, I haven't facilitated in a few minutes, but uh, I was attending the AA. Okay, how many minutes? <laughs> let's say let's say a couple of years. Okay. And I'm sorry, go ahead. And and you just started attending AA within the again within the last six months. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am, pretty much. Okay, before then, uh, what were you doing as far as your sobriety was concerned? I took I did another uh, AA 12 step course in 2018. I graduated in 2018. And after that, I've taken Thinking for a Change. Yeah, what tell us about Thinking for a Change. What did you What did you get out of that? Yes, ma'am. The biggest thing I got out of that is that I can't control the actions of others, but I can control the way I respond to them. Plus, I, under, I understand. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I understand how to do effective listening, and understanding the feelings of others. Mm -hmm. I've taken all that into consideration. Let me ask you this, have you taken victim awareness? No, ma'am. Uh, have you had the opportunity to take it? I was scheduled to take victim's awareness when I had started having strokes. And then when I, after, since I, I go three days a week to physical therapy, and uh, they've got a class going right now that they haven't finished their classes yet. You can't just, you can't just get in in the middle of these classes once they start. You have to start at the beginning of the cycle. I understand that. Um, but even without having taken victim awareness, how do you think your uh, crime has affected the victim's family? Ma'am, I fully understand the pain and the suffering that I've caused the Boyd family. I've taken full responsibility for it, and I understand okay. that, ma'am. Tell me, tell me.
how you have affected them. Give me specifics and how you feel like. Put yourself in their shoes. Yes, ma'am. Tell me how you think this crime has affected their lives. Oh, I know it's deeply impacted them because she has small children. Uh, Miss Boyd has small children at the time. And I can imagine the financial burden and the pain and suffering that I caused them. I've, I've tried to put myself in the shoes. I've reflected on this for 43 years. I've had a lot of time to think about this. And I know that I've deeply hurt them. And there's no way I could ever repay for the damage that I've done. Well, tell me what kind of... Um other than the classes and the programs that you talked about, uh, have you been involved in any uh, activities that benefit or uh, help other offenders? Tell, tell us some, some, I guess, if you will, some community service that you've given during your yes, situation. Yes, ma'am. I played, uh, played in a band for 17 years. They had the opportunity. We played at uh, every rodeo. We played for officer appreciation days. We played, had a chance to go uh, travel on the streets and play for different nights out against crime, balloon festivals, and Christmas parades. And and what, like about, that. what about inside the prison that directly impacted other offenders? We played inside the prison, too, for banquets and stuff like that. The church banquets, played a lot of gospel music at the church. You have a lot of opposition, uh, Mr. Mark. Um, it comes from the DA, the sheriff's office, uh, the victim's uh, son, uh, his widow, another son, and a daughter. So there are a lot of lives that have been impacted um, by this crime. I just need you to understand that. Uh, you do have letters of support. Uh, are you married? When were you married? I got married in 1993 and got divorced in 2017. Okay. Uh, but you have some stepchildren? Yes, ma'am. Are your stepchildren? Ma'am, I didn't hear the question. Who are your stepchildren? Cindy Nick, Cindy Nichols and Connie Pauly. Okay. And then you have a step-granddaughter, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Who is Marina? Marina? Uh, who is Marina? She's behind me. Okay. Um, and they've uh, written letters of support um, on your behalf. Uh, if you were to be um, successful, uh, Mr. Marsh, what would be, I, I know your parole project uh, client, but beyond that, what would be your transition plan? What would be your transition? What do you plan to live? How do you plan to support yourself? So what would be your transition plan? I believe right now, after after parole project, I would transition to uh, Mr. Bordelon's house. And there I work with him and go into AA during, in Alexandria. And uh, as far as supporting myself, I've got, a, I've got a lot of graphic arts and computer programming. That I can utilize. I'm still. I've still got one good hand I can use. Warren, what can you tell us about Mr. Marsh? Uh, let me think. Pardon? You're asking me right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The other Warren. Warren. Okay, I'm sorry. Warren Hoover stepped out. So. Uh, yeah, James has, has been here, like I said, for some 40 plus years. Uh, the majority of his time spent here has been up at the dog pen for us, uh, working with the canines, uh, which over the years has definitely been a trusted position. He's done that up until mid-2017 is when he started having 
issue health issues. Um, he currently, as he stated, has had uh, multiple strokes that has led to uh, with a pretty extreme left sided weakness. Um, he's got a past medical history of blood pressure, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. He's a type 2 diabetic as well. Um, he has really, over the years, not given us any trouble. He is, he's been a positive uh, aspect of the dog pen while he was up there for the many years that he was. Did I, I, did I see correctly on his disciplinary record uh, that he has 19 write-ups, but the last one was in 1986? I kind of had a question about that, if that was accurate. Bear with me one second and I'll let you know, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. He had a, a work offense in uh, November 10th of 86, and that's the last write up he's had. Oh. All right. Thank you very much, Warren. I appreciate um, the input. That's all I have. Is Thank you. All right. Um, at this time, we'd like to hear the folks who are uh, calling in support. Do we have uh, Warden Van Oy, is he? Is he? Is he? Uh, Ms. Nicole Johnson. I'm here. Okay, go ahead. What would you like us to know? Um, I would just like to say that he um, has expressed um, full responsibility and he's always just um, expressed that if he could go back and change it, he would. Um, but that he can't, so that, you know, obviously he was, um, in the prison system, you know, doing his time. Um, I fully believe that he has, um, found ways to earn skills and, um, you know, found ways to get knowledge while he was in. Um, and I, I don't believe that he would reoffend. All right, thank you, ma'am. We appreciate thank your input. Mr. Bordelon, hear from you. Yes. I wanted to uh, to say that when I first met Marsh, it was when they were first starting the Dog City up behind the range. I was an instructor at the academy at the time, but also an instructor on the range. And somebody had this idea that they were going to put an inmate out there unsupervised, which is right on the border of Angola. He would have tools, he would have equipment, and yet the range was somehow going to be responsible for him. And I couldn't believe that they would do something like this. And I wanted to meet this fantastic inmate that they're going to put out there who is not going to leave. And it was James Marsh. He worked up there by himself with all the, the means, the ability to escape to cause trouble, to get in trouble, but he worked up there for 17 years with no trouble, no complaints at all. After that, I wanna talk about Katrina. After the storm, the emergency teams responded down there. And uh, our job, of course, was to evacuate Orleans Parish Prison and Charity Hospital. And once that was done, we had to start a new city jail in this town that had turned lawless. It was a crazy place if any of you guys were there. So when I go down to the Amtrak station, which is the site for this new city jail, the first person I run into is Marsh. He's down there working again, unsupervised with some other inmates, driving vehicles, all the ability to leave, to cause harm, to cause chaos or join the chaos that was currently going on down there. And again, no trouble at all. They did their job longer than they stayed there longer than I stayed and came back. After that, I, want, oh, I also want to say that uh, I was down there working with overtime and ex expanded K time, and he was doing it for 20 cents an hour. And still, like I said, no trouble. Over the years, as I moved through the ranks, became the supervisor of the training center, the range, and the armory. Uh, would could always call on Marsh. He was the go-to guy. Drawing blueprints, engineering, woodworking, art, music, mechanics, everything. He, he was the guy. Over the years, he made me look good. Now, 
after I retired, I waited the, the year as prescribed and I got on his visiting list and I've been up here several times to see him. Uh, right now I have an empty house that no one is living in that he's welcome to stay there as long as he's his needs not with me, but in another house. And the reason I say that, I know that you guys who know me are thinking about the gun issue. Not an issue, not my house, another house, okay? He can stay there as long as he likes. I can get him to his AA meetings. If his recovery stalls, we can take care of it. But this guy, I've known him for 25 years and has never been a, a, a bit of problem. If you have any questions. No, sir, thank you. You're well done. Thank you very much. Uh, can we hear from the parole project? Mr. Myers. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Terry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Here to tell you that uh, James Marsh is our client. Uh, we are committed to supporting uh, Mr. Marsh through his transition should he get a recommendation today and either be uh, in a signature from the governor. Um, I think it's um, impressive um, that a former ranking security officer uh, uh, that once supervised Mr. Marsh is here today, um, not only to express his support, uh, but is willing to provide him long-term housing uh, and assistance. Uh, parole Project will provide Mr. Marsh with, with uh, transitional programming and housing. Uh, 40, uh, 43 years is a long time, and we all know that the world's changed significantly in those 43 years. We'll help Mr. Marsh uh, through that transition. He is eligible for SSI. Uh, he, will have, he will have income. We will make sure that he is connected to those services. Uh, and to any other services that he needs. He'll also learn how to use technology, um, understand social norms, um, and the other the necessities that he needs during this transition. We'll provide case management for Mr. Marsh out through the first year. But, you know, Parole Project has a saying, once a client, always a client. Um, so Mr. Marsh will, will certainly be aware that he can call us uh, at any time with us if he needs assistance. Um, also, I think what was pointed out earlier, it's incredible that he has not had a write-up in more than 37 years. Um, that's, that's that's just a testament to his character, to who he is uh, today, to who he wanted to become uh, 37 years ago when he stopped getting disciplinary write-ups. Uh, he's prepared to maintain his sobriety uh, upon his release. So we just ask for all these reasons that this board grant him a recommendation today. Thank you. Um, and we'll hear from the opposition. Did we hear from, uh, is it Chris Moy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry, would you step up to the podium? And, and just to acknowledge that we do have a, a several documents that was provided to us by the victim's family this morning. We have that. Good afternoon, board. First part of remorse is to admit James until today has never admitted what he has done for over 40 years. The second part of remorse is that responsibility. He never had to apologize. If he had, if he had remorse, he would know each and every one of us by our names, including the man he murdered. He was point blank told about a wife and three kids before James stabbed and got him. He never received any charge for the robbery. The morning of the murder, they all made a U-turn and passed my dad when he was on the side of the road. He had a second chance right there to say, hey guys, I just screwed up. I, let's pick this guy up and take him to the hospital. No, instead he went fishing. His true colors were shown at the last year when he was denied. He stormed out with an attitude, the same attitude the morning he stabbed my dad, that is no sign of remorse. But with all being said, the biggest problem about all this, our dad was put in a position that he, that he could not only defend his family anymore, but was fighting to defend his life. He told Jimmy Barnes his last words, to tell my wife and kids, they don't love him. My dad died a broken heart. Good morning. God have mercy on his soul. Bowers? Yes, he 
in the white house on the door in the old spell one thing. Before I get into that, I want to say about this. James Marsh is the one that flipped the father off transcripts. He's also the one that indicated let's turn around Paul and these other the guy that was driving this evil bad words starting with a P to make him turn around to go to the that is in the 983rd page of the transcripts. He is the one that made them turn around. He is the one that pushed them to turn around and go do this. And they did have a second chance to win. There's no write ups in this file. But as a guard in Mississippi, you can have personal relationships with inmates. This guard stood up and said that he has a personal relationship with the inmate. And I have a problem with that because there wouldn't be any write ups. If you're friends with a guard, why would he write you up? Like my brother said, he got up, the anger issues were there because when he was in the last room, he did get up and throw the chair and walk off in the last year. We, the family, are here today to beg of the board to take him on to start his life sentence. Marsh has no acceptance, no responsibility, or no remorse for what he's done. If you look at a YouTube video, the front page was submitted to you. Video shows Marsh in the band. And when he is asked, why are you in prison? He said, I was in a wreck. He never admitted that he murdered a man that had three kids in his life. That was not to do this, he told him, I have a wife and three kids. I currently serve on the MDOC board, so I'm aware of the parole board and has the duties, and I do not agree with his request. We are a real family with real trauma in our lives. We forever have been changed by this. James Marsh being incarcerated is the only peace that we have. We need to go to a good time. He's not seeing his grandkids grow up. He's not walking them out. He has done one thing. I had no idea growing up that a life sentence truly did not mean it was a life sentence. Never did I think our family would have to continuously go through this and fight him, but we will every step of the I promise you, we will fight him. Lord, I leave you with one last comment. Our lives have been affected and torn apart mentally, physically. Emotionally, and our stability has affected us still today. So I plead with you today, just as my father pleaded for his life, make more serve this life sentence. And I have one more thing to add. When he stabbed, you know, and left him on the side of the road, I have the keys that were in his pocket with his picture of his kids on them. That's all he asked for was to be here to praise his kids and have his wife with him. Please don't worry about it. Please. Thank you. Send me. Mr. Jackson, thank you for your questions. What was going to be actually that's a question or ask that I can, you know, you, you asked a certain amount of questions. I've never heard those. And uh, I appreciate you asking what he's done. And um, the situation that occurred that night, he's never been forced to admit it in front of us. So I, I, I do appreciate that. The first thing I want to talk to you all about is. If you all put yourselves in our shoes, his family, him, put yourself in our shoes. And I want to ask you, what's the value of your life? What's the time value of your life? 
42 years, 43 years, 60 years. What's the value of your daughter, your father, your son? What's their time value? He can go through all these great things in prison. The fact is, we can't commute my father's sentence. He's in a cell. My father's in the grounds. We can't commute that. And for somebody to say he's got, and I'm glad he's doing all those great things, and that he's got a burden to the prison system. I'm glad of that. But the fact is, I can't bring my dad back. And that's why he's in there in the first place. That night that occurred six months ago when we found out this, this thing was going to happen, all of us started rereading these, these court transcripts. If you look at the testimony, and, those, and everybody brings up that I have a wife and three kids, everyone that testified in that court hearing, except for him, he said, now he did say, my father told him I have a wife and three kids. The other three individuals that testified didn't say he said it. They said he hollered it. Come on, man, I got a wife. He was begging for his life. But you sit in front of us today begging for your freedom, but you wouldn't extend that to my father. My dad saw that night. That's why he hollered, come on, man, I got a wife and three kids. Holler. Didn't say holler. He was, he was not bargaining with you. You made him beg for his life. You had the opportunity because as soon as you got back in the road, you made a U-turn, and it's in the testimony that my dad was running back towards Jimmy Barnes. Jimmy Barnes, God rest his soul, lived with the guilt all his life. All his life. That he ran away and didn't help my dad. Had Jimmy helped my dad, I'm sure there would have been two murders because it wouldn't even been solved. So I'm glad Jimmy ran away. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get it. You can't put a value on someone's life, especially a time value or a monetary value. All we ask you all to do is what the state of Louisiana promised us that we do, and that's keep him in prison. So we don't have to worry about this. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. All right, Mr. Marsh, is there a statement you'd like to make before we turn it over to your attorney? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to say that. I truly regret what happened that night, and there was absolutely no reason for Mr. Boyd to have died on the side of that road like that. It was my indifference and my 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 uh my behavior that caused Mr. Boyd's death that night, that morning. Excuse me. I wish it, I wish it, I could redo everything all over again. Like I said, I've had a lot of time to reflect on things and what I would have done different. And I'm so thankful. I thank God that I quit drinking when I did. And that he's going to maintain my sobriety. And I appreciate y'all giving me this opportunity today. Yes, sir. Ms. Slyer. Um, before I begin, could I just ask if Daryl Vinoy was able to get onto the Zoom? I know he intended to speak. He, he did, but he was unable to connect. Uh, he, I see. That tended to. Okay, okay. James Marsh came to prison when he was only 20 years old and without a criminal record. It's hard to comprehend why James acted so violently back in 1979 because there really is no logic or sense to it. He acted in a drunken stupor at a time in his life when he had nothing to lose and gave no consideration to the safety of himself or for others. If James could turn back the hands of time and talk some sense into his 20 year old self, I imagine he would do so quite convincingly considering the progress he's made in the past 43 years. Although James cannot control the hands of time or take back the tremendous harm that he caused the Boyd family, he recognized, he recognized as a young man that he could control his own behavior and he managed to completely turn his life around. James's impressive institutional record is only one example of his transformation. In the time I've spent with James, it's been clear to me that he didn't just take programming uh, and educational courses just to take them, but he applied them, he applied what he learned seriously to his life and his daily practices. James is now well equipped with a tool belt of techniques and skills for regulating his impulses, maintaining healthy relationships, and employing hard work and creativity. Today, James has a lot to live for, and it's sitting here behind him. 
As you've seen from his letters of support, James has been able to develop and maintain loving and supportive relationships with his, his daughters and his grandchildren, and he's even been able to apply what he's learned in prison to help them through tough times. I must say that James made my, made my job quite easy in that everyone I spoke to had wonderful things to say about him. His achievements are plentiful and his remorse has always been genuine. This to me is a sign that he is ready and prepared to be successful outside of prison. James takes full responsibility for the death of Michael Boyd and deeply regrets the harm and pain that he caused. James, like the Boyd family, has a personal understanding of how fleeting life can be. The only way James could attempt to make up for the life that he took was to make his own life meaningful, and he's done just about everything he can do. He hopes to spend his remaining years living a positive, a positive life and making a good impression on the world around him. Now, James is 63 years old. He's largely confined to a wheelchair and due to a stroke has lost use of his left arm. Despite his physical limitations, James does not waver in his commitment to simply being a good person. It's my belief that James has served enough time, that he's fully rehabilitated, and that he will be an asset to his community outside of prison if he's given the opportunity to be. For these reasons and more, I ask that the board recommend that James's sentence be commuted with immediately immediate parole eligibility. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're prepared to vote. Ms. I'd like to ask for an intervention. Ms. Jackson is for executive session. Can we have the roll call, please? Sharon Upson? Yes. 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 So we'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. We'll be right back. All right, we are back in regular session uh, and we are prepared to vote. Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. All right, uh, Mr. March, um, this is a good case. Uh, we have been incarcerated for a very long time. But for me, I struggle with the fact that you've not taken a whole lot of rehabilitative programs. You haven't done a lot to address some of the underlying issues that caused you to commit this crime. Uh, I do understand that you've been working, but you know, I think you should have prioritized programming to get something in you that would benefit you in the long run. But because of uh, your lack of rehabilitative programming and victim opposition, I vote today to deny. Mr. Rocha. Mr. Marsh, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. My understanding of this is maybe the second or third hearing that you've had. And you've been told you need programming based on a life a rehabilitative program adamant opposition from the victim's children and strong law enforcement opposition. My vote is to deny your request. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and courage and to be here today. And, and I have heard, I've heard the thing, thing so. I understand. I don't understand what you I can only imagine what you As a board member, it's my responsibility to take all of those things into consideration, as well as what Mr. Marsh has accomplished while he's been in prison. And as I look at that, I see a low risk, excellent disciplinary record, good prison record, a uh, trusted position while he's been in prison medical issues, a very good transition. My vote would be to grant a commutation to 99 years for all eligibility. That doesn't need to be released today. And I'm only one. Mr. Freeman? Uh, my vote, uh, due to the length of incarceration and the institutional record, I would vote to commute to 99. It will be the end of the law. All right, Mr. Mr. Marsh, you know, uh, you've been through the process before. It takes four votes, four favorable votes for a favorable recommendation. So today you've received 
two votes to deny your application, and that you have received two votes that were favorable. So the outcome of today's proceeding is that your application for clemency has been denied, sir. 